Welcome to MRTV's People in XR. This is the podcast that introduces you to the most exciting players in the industry. And here is your host, Sebastian Ong. In this episode of the People in XR podcast, it's my utmost pleasure to welcome Nathan Berber, who is the co-founder and president of Servius. Hi, Nathan. How are you doing? Uh, good, Sebastian. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining this podcast series. So I'm very, very excited to speak with you because, well, you're making my favorite VR games. <laughs> so for all of you who don't know Servius yet, Nathan, could you quickly describe what games you have done so far? Uh, yeah, I mean, Servios, we're a, you know, a virtual reality company in Los Angeles, and uh, we've built uh, Raw Data, Sprint Vector, uh, Electronauts, and Creed. Uh, those are our four titles. And we're working on uh, a number of others. Wow. Oh, you're working on a number of others. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is really good news for all the VR community because, well, every single game that you have, um, yeah, that you have published so far, I must say I love it. And, well, most of the VR community, I think everyone loves your games. So it's going to be super interesting to find out how you come up with these games and how you manage to to just make these games that people love so much so um tell us a bit more about servios the company that you co-founded since when since when does the company exist yeah um so we originally started as a company in uh the middle of 2013 in may of 2013 um and uh, we actually were a project before that we were project holodeck uh, at uh, University of Southern California. Um, so essentially, myself and the other three co-founders uh, were working on virtual reality technology at USC. And when that project concluded, we uh, basically uh, you know, started up Servios to continue doing our research. And that led to doing virtual reality hardware development, virtual reality game development, and really planted the seeds for raw data, which was our first title, or really our flagship title, our breakout title. And that allowed us to build the technology and the team to then uh, really uh, nurture a world-class uh, game studio where we're able to build, you know, some of the, in our opinion, some of the best titles that are out there. And then we also have uh, a number of other things we're doing. We have an arcade distribution network where we um, ship not only our titles but other titles to arcades all over the world. And then we also have our own arcade down in Torrance, uh, which is our first of its kind, and we'll be opening up more arcades as well. So we're very much uh, bullish on shipping both to the home consumer, you know, great content, and then shipping uh, great content as well to arcades. Wow, that is incredible. So it's not just the homeowners, also arcade. That is incredible. So um, how many how many people are working for Servios right now? Uh, it's uh, a little over 100. Um, we have down, uh, in, down here in Los Angeles. Uh, if you can include everything we do from marketing and distribution to the studio side, we have engineers and artists, designers. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a fully functioning multi-project studio. Uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different people who work here. Wow, that is incredible. So probably like you are one of the biggest VR game development studios in the world right now. Would you say that? I, I think so. <laughs> wow. Yes. Incredible. That's incredible. So your first VR game was Raw Data. And it's, it's, it just sounded like you were like doing it um, out, of, out of university or with your, with your university friends together. Yeah, well, so um, it originally started, uh, you know, to go all the way back. Um, uh, you know, James and I, uh, James Iliff, uh, fellow co-founder, chief creative officer, uh, we started uh, Project Holodeck uh, back in 2012 uh, while we were working, uh, working with uh, Palmer Lucky and other researchers at the USC Mixed Reality Lab. And that was where we first got introduced to virtual reality, motion tracking systems, that sort of thing. And that project was an effort to build a simple, streamlined, um, a simple, simple, streamlined multiplayer, wireless, full motion, virtual reality system, and then build a game for it as well. Uh, and this was a, a lot of things to do. And we ended up, um, that, was, that was for the USC Advanced Games uh, program there. Um, and uh, so we took, uh, you know, over the course of that one year program, those two semesters, we um, ended up uh, developing um, both the hardware and the software. We made a game called Wild Skies, which is a ship flying game. And you basically had two people in virtual reality together in a system you could hook up in maybe 10 or 20 minutes using um, a head-mounted display that we had, um, uh, it was generously borrowed, uh, loaned to us 
from the USC Mixed Reality Lab called the Socket Head Mounted Display, which Palmer himself had worked on, kind of like an early version of the Oculus Rift. We combined that with the Razer Hydra motion tracking system and the PlayStation Move motion tracking system, along with like a bulky helmet that we made and all this other kind of stuff, a backpack that we put together, laptops that you wore on your back. And then we actually had, so we had two players in wireless virtual reality together. Um, and they were able to be on the ship together and fly around and, and, and engage enemies in combat and, and have full body IK. Um, so kind of all things that are very ahead of their time. This is back in uh, early 2013. Um, and so what we were able to do, uh, so uh, at the beginning of that project, we were able to uh, find two other incredible engineers, uh, Alex Silkin and Graham Medijewski. Um, and uh, Alex, uh, you know, is our, is our CTO today. Um, so basically... Uh, we had, um, you know, th those four people and the number of other people working on this project. We concluded in May of 2013 with a demonstration of Wild Skies and the entire system. Uh, and then after that, we were able to maintain uh, some of the intellectual property that we had developed at USC. And we, we took that all together and put together a business plan, like a 100-page business plan, and he started pitching to investors to say, hey, we want to take this uh, you know, uh, piece of technology we were developing and, and build it into something that we could sell at some point, uh, some sort of business we could build out of it. And that was what turn, turned into uh, Servios. And so we found initial early angel investors here in Los Angeles uh, who invested in us um, to start the company up, uh, ended up building a, a smaller prototype and a new title, which uh, James and Alex had been working on at USC, called Zombies on the Holodeck. And back then, Zombies on the Holodeck was actually, we did release one version of it for free for the um, Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. So this is, you know, pre-raw data days. Um, but we, we had released that. I think it's actually like in that time period, it was like the top rated VR title or something like that. It was kind of like a, like a, like a Left 4 Dead kind of style title with a lot of environmental storytelling and zombies who would come out and, and you know, to shotgun and all sorts of things. Um, so a lot of, lot of multi-hand interactions. Um, but basically, um, we had built that into a really stellar tech demo, and we, we streamlined our hardware tech down to one very small backpack and the Oculus HD, actually, which was a, um, after the Oculus DK1 but before the DK2. It was a very nice streamlined head-mounted display with no motion tracking, but we added the motion tracking bit with some custom, custom optical tracking we built. And so um, we had this uh, Zombies in the Holodeck demo that we could then take and, and, and easily demo to other places besides in Los Angeles. And we showed that to some potential investors up in San Francisco, including Rob Coneybeer, who ended up leading our Series A round of funding. We raised a lot more, more money there, about $4 million. Um, and with that, we were able to really start building the studio out properly. And that, um, that really is what led to the R&D and the development of uh, first a game called Bullet Time Apex, which was a multiplayer, almost like kind of like Metal Gear Solid kind of game uh, where it was like a stealth action game. Um, and that we developed all the, me the mechanics and the tools and everything uh, inside of Unreal for that game. That was the game that kind of, um, it was a really tech demo, it was like 30 minutes long. That led us to um, building out the technology that was needed for raw data. And so we basically pivoted that project into what everyone knows uh, of as raw data today. Um, with uh, you know teleporting and different characters and different weapons and uh, and then it, then it was you know a, a big project of actually putting together an entire world and story and uh, all the technology I mean all the incredible work James and Alex and and uh, you know uh, Justin Daniel Zelligman Mike McTire um, a whole team of people just uh, doing fantastic work to really bring that to life but we wanted to build like the halo of VR you know something that was um, had an incredible graphics, incredible story, incredible gameplay, um, really had kind of all the bells and whistles and really was really a premium title for VR. And at that time when the Vive first came out, there really wasn't much else like it. Um, and uh, even to this day, it still, you know, holds up. If you play it, you can play the whole, play through the whole game uh, sitting down in a rift and it's still, it's an incredible experience. It's very much what you, exactly what you want in a VR, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, that, that was our flagship title and kind of put us on the map, so to speak. Um, and then from there, it was just, you know, what else can we do? What other kind of great experiences can we make? And, and what kind of right, um, right. portfolio can we build with great titles? Wow. That, that is so much information. Thank you so much for letting us know about how you got into raw data. There's so many pearls I want to dive into now. <laughs> so actually, 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 it, it everything happened like before the big before the big um, VR, um, yeah, mainstream rush. I mean, it happened when the Rift came out, right? There was 2016, but all the all the things leading to raw data, it happened way before 
people were thinking about VR so much, right? Like, like you just said, at USC, you were working in a little lab and you were building these devices and working on uh, working on controllers using the Move controllers. Basically, you had the idea before Sony came up with PSVR, right? Yeah, well, so um, Sony was, you know, tinkering in their own lab, just like we were tinkering in our lab. Uh, and they, um, I think they had a prototype in 2014 that they were working on. Um, of course, you know, for Sony, it, it, for them to ship PSVR, it takes, you know, $500 million dollars in multiple years to, right. to get all of those pieces in place. So we were ahead of the curve. Um, I, I think they, I'm, I'm sure Sony was working on it. I know Richard Marks was working on things in a lab and it was showing Sony executives in about 2014. Um, so essentially it was kind of doing things in parallel. And if you read about the history of any really great game studio, uh, usually they're, you know, two years ahead of a technological jump and they're okay. working with the hardware that has to be refined into a consumer product and they're kind of getting their hands on it early. So you have a company in 19, you know, Rare in 1994 is working with a $100,000 Silicon Graphics workstation two years before the N64 comes out. Um, and that allows them to to build, you know, the uh, Donkey Kong 64, or whatever title they're building, right, or, or Perfect Dark or something, or GoldenEye actually, right? right. Um, that allows them to, to do that work. Uh, yeah, GoldenEye was the title. It was, basically, they can do that work ahead of time um, and then be ready for when the market kind of comes out. So we had a similar advantage uh, when, when it comes to VR. Wow. But at that time, were you already sure that this is going to be the next big thing in gaming? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Um, right. I, I think we, uh, it was definitely a very strong passion of ours and a very strong curiosity of ours. And then when you had, you know, Palmer hooking up with John Carmack and that making a big splash, I mean, I would say that right there, you know, if you know your gaming history, um, you know, that kind of made it pretty obvious this is the next place to go. And, um, have you ever read Masters of Doom? Um, no, I no. didn't. It's, it's the story of John Carmack and John Romero and the creation of id Software. Okay. And, uh, you know, all of the, um, if you read, read about that, uh, it's really about the creation of technology that lets you get closer inside the head of a video game character. You're removing the abstractions of the character. You're getting down, you know, more into a visceral first person, right? You have, where you actually feel like you're the character. Well, virtual reality was one, one more step in that direction, getting even closer into the character. So I could see the progression from, you know, what we had before Wolfenstein mm -hmm. uh, to Wolfenstein to Doom. This, to me, seemed like a progression even further down into that. Um, and those games had a massive impact, uh, created a whole new genre. And, you know, half the games we play today are first-person shooters. So to me, VR has the potential to have a similar impact. I think there's technological hurdles that are, you know, uh, fairly difficult um, to overcome. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, to me, the, the, like they say, you can read the tea, le tea leaves, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that metaphor. Uh, well, the Masters of Doom to me was always, that was the, the tea leaves right there. All right. Okay. That's definitely on my reading list now. So Fantastic book. I mean, if, it's like, you know, it's like game development porn. If you okay. Can, All right. Okay. Yeah, I'll right. definitely like have to early, read that book then. <laughs> it's an early stories. It's so, you know, it's it's such like it was a Wild West time. You know, it was, it was a lot, it's a really fun read. All right. I mean, like now it's also still a bit Wild West time of VR. Wouldn't you say so? Um. Or is it already getting too mainstream to be Wild West now? <laughs> I mean, I would say it's it's hard for something like information spreads so quickly today that it's hard for something to be quite the Wild West that it that it kind of the way things used to be. That being said, the experiences don't spread very fast. What's great about VR is you can't just show it to someone on a phone and, and they go, OK, right. I get it now. You You have to put it on. So. What that means is the information spreads fairly slowly as to like what the experience really is like. So from that standpoint, it's still kind of the Wild West. There's still a lot of possibilities. Um, but I think it, you know, it, it's not going to have the um, – it's hard to have something have a massive explosion. Like even if you look at Doom where they're able to go from no – they're, they're nobodies to selling millions of units of something kind of overnight. It's a little bit harder to spread um, something new and innovative – right now um 
you know, through kind of uh, like they were able to reuse computers that people were using for like office work before uh, and really turn them into proper gaming machines. Um, but when people get headsets, they kind of they're expecting to play games on them. They're expecting to play good games. And there's a ton of content out there. So um, I, I think the Wild West aspect of it is if we see a techno technological leap from one of the larger companies that really blows everyone away, um, then I think uh, that's going to be the inflection point that makes it a really fun time. And, and that could come next year or it could come five years from now. It's kind of a little hard to tell. Right, of course. So I'm wondering, when was your first touch point with VR? When you went to that university? When when, when was the, 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 the moment of truth for you when you put on yeah. H&D for the first time? And what were your thoughts at this moment? So the first time I ever put on an HMD, I was doing a, um, a vision test. Um, it, very, it was incredibly boring. <laughs> uh, it was someone, um, there's, a, there's a researcher named Adam who actually gave Palmer the idea for the name Oculus, uh, funny enough. Um, uh, he, uh, and I can tell that story in a minute, but he uh, just had um, a headbender display that he put on me. It was called, I think it's called the Wide 5. It was one of the ones they had at the, the lab. And he was just doing like calibration on it, and he just needed me to calibrate. And just looking down this hallway, I felt this sense of calm and kind of a calming isolation, mm -hmm. um, which was very, very nice. And even even doing nothing, I kind of understood the, the power and the gravity of a headbender display. Um, and at that time, I had been doing Microsoft Connect research, so I had, had a deep understanding of motion tracking. And so really, the concept of virtual reality was put together in my head way before I ever had – I really never had a mind-blowing experience of virtual reality. It was more – I had a mind-blowing idea, and then right. I've been chasing that idea ever since of um, – what would it be? What is what is it like if I blank or you know if if I try this if I try this? Um, so it's uh, it's always been a concept that's that's been evolving for me, and and that's allowed allowed me to you know to to work on a lot of hardware projects and and, and experiment and try to um, you know keep an open mind with regard to VR. You know VR is not just a head mounted display into motion controllers, right? It's it's a much broader concept than that. Right. So then I would rephrase my question. When was the first moment for you when you felt like, okay, wow, that is actually co pretty close to what I was hoping for VR to become. That first time I looked through that, that HMD of your colleague. Um, you know, it's funny. I would say definitely playing wild skies when we had the, the system all hooked up and we're actually in there for a little bit. I think it might've been December of 2012 and, uh, you know, everything had, had been hooked up and, and you actually feel like you're in the virtual world and you're there with someone else and you can hear them talking. And because it was two people in the same space, you'd actually touch them too. You could like touch someone's shoulder and you were wireless too. Um, basically it was like, you know, the graphics weren't that great. It was very simple graphics. Um, we kind of didn't really know what we were doing back then, but that, feeling of being immersed in that world and kind of lost in it. I remember we used to be in there for hours just, you, you know, um, just testing things. Um, that was my first kind of like really proper goosebumps feeling. Um, actually, I would say another goosebumps feeling was uh, I, uh, getting zombies in the holodeck working um, with, uh, I think I got it working with like an early version of the hardware we were using. And I was at my house and I was, uh, I was, it was dark and I was alone and I got, I was in there and I got scared. Um, I wasn't a hundred percent sure because I hadn't played too much of the game because I was focused on the hardware more than James and Alex were focused on the game. So when I finally got in the game, I, um, because I was alone and I, I hadn't gotten this level of immersion yet, I was really, really terrified. Um, and, uh, it kind of, uh, you know, you get those kind of goosebump mo moments as a developer, especially the moments of immersion, um, where you kind of, where unexpected things might happen. That's mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, what's really interesting to me. Wow, definitely. So you, you basically got scared by playing your own game, even though you totally knew what was coming up. Well, I think I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, because I wasn't working on the game directly. Right. I was working on the hardware that okay. supports the game. I didn't, I had, luckily I didn't know what to expect. And I think that was actually, not knowing what to expect is uh, a, a big part of the fun and a big part of, um, you know, uh, what immerses you in the first place. There's no, there's no immersion without a sense of danger. 
you know. That's right. In so, life. <laughs> probably that's also one reason I, I really cannot play horror games. It's just too immersive and it feels too real. So I, I rather play games like uh, I don't know, Raw Data or Sprint Vector. These 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 kind of games. <laughs> Do you like horror games? Do you play horror games? Um, no, I'm not a big horror guy. Uh, okay. I like more of a foreboding sense of dread. Like a like a, a um, I just watched um, what's that movie about? Um, it takes place in Eastern Europe. It just came out recently. Uh, Suspiria. Mm, not it sure. Came about out like mm. a month and a half ago. It's a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Or or the movie The Witch is another one that's just kind of similar. Uh, basically, I like kind of like a slow burn horror where All right. things are getting darker and creepier. Got kind of it. like um. Resident Evil 4 is kind of like this. All right. Um, yes. Where you get that foreboding sense as opposed right. to like the kind of shock, you know. Um, I got it. You like more the atmosphere. You don't like the jump scares. Right, exactly. All right. Yeah, that makes that makes lots of sense. Anyways, I would like to understand more your role in, in the early days there at USC. So um, you are like a, a hardware engineer or are you more the software engineer or what, what are you actually um, doing at these days? What was your expertise? Sure. Um, well, it, it varied. Uh, so I'm a software engineer by trade. When I went to USC, I started learning about mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, a lot of the you know, industrial design, a lot of the things I didn't, uh, I didn't really know about. I kind of had to learn, and that was actually a big part of the fun. So when we were in, uh, doing Project Holodeck, I was the project director. So just the whole thing, I had to you know lead and, and manage the whole thing. Um, but on, on as as the project broke down. I basically was the hardware guy, so I was pretty much putting together all of the hardware um, and then uh, gathering the software for it and the software warping and then and, and like all the all the so the software layer that makes the hardware work basically all of the uh, not only the drivers but the ability to um, VNC into the systems and set up this the client server architecture like that kind of thing I was responsible for with a Alex being the lead engineer and then James basically being the creative and design lead um, and then Graham being uh, you know being an engineer with Alex that was kind of how we, we broke things down um, so I was essentially the primary hardware guy and then when push came to shove with Wild Skies Wild Skies was kind of my baby as a as a games my you know idea and the thing I kind of push for a lot um, I ended up doing a lot of um, just design work on it and scripting and uh, level layout and uh, and that sort of thing as well. So I, I'm honestly just a jack, jack of all trades, but historically I have been the hardware guy. And then once the once we started putting the company together, I've been the the business guy um, wow. and the recruiting guy and the operations guy. Okay. Um, so in terms of you know starting the corporation and, and finding a lawyer, getting all the legal paperwork. Negotiating contracts, raising funding. Um, usually, right. it's it, James, James and I historically working together. Um, you know, with with all of those things, um, and then uh, you know, I, I'm just kind of where the com wherever the company needs me, I kind of conform to that. Uh, and then when I'm when I don't have anything else to do, I'm just doing. I'm just a game developer, um, like any, like anybody else. Got it. So that's that's a very interesting point. So you kind of um, from the from the from the hardware part from really being hands on uh, working on these H and D's now with with servios and with your company growing bigger and bigger, you kind of went into this management role, right? You're doing some completely different things now that you did in the beginning. So I'm wondering, um, do you enjoy this role now, this um, um, growing the business, getting the funds or making these decisions? Or do you sometimes think, oh, damn, I would love to go hands down on this next game and really um, like work on that game more? Yeah, I mean, there's a natural tension there. You know, what I found is that the best leader knows how to do the job of everyone under them um, for various reasons. A, if they have to step in and do it, but B, it just allows you to uh, commiserate with people, talk about their work. Um, there's not so much of a wall there. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of take a, um, like a small business approach, I guess, or a small team approach. And as the company's grown, honestly, it's been a very, very, very challenging to do that because, um, there's just, you know, I, a hundred people, I have to know who everyone is. I, I say hi to everybody on a daily basis. I involve myself, you know, kind of, in a lot of the different work that goes on, whether it's marketing and branding and PR or it's engineering or art and design and creative um, or it's the, the business aspects of things, um, I, I'm ultimately, you know, as the, I was the CEO of the company for five years and the, and the company president, I've been the president now for uh, I think about, about six or seven months. 
um, it's I'm ultimately uh, you know responsible for the company and um, have to uh, make sure that everything is running smoothly and make sure anyone can can reach out to me if necessary and, and talk to me. I'm kind of an open, very much open door policy with everyone. Um, and, uh, so it, it's, it's very challenging to do that. And at the same time, keep my skills sharp. Uh, my skills are not as sharp as I'd like them to be. I'm actually right now going back through unreal engine tutorials and keeping current with unity tutorials as well. Um, so it's, I don't know, it, it's a crazy lifestyle. It's trying to do a million things at once all the time. Um, so I don't know if there's any roadmap to success for that, but, uh, but it's, it's definitely interesting. I'll say that. Yeah. It sounds very, very um, demanding, of course. I'm sure it is if you have to lead a company with 100 people. Anyways, also what I'm very interested in, you said that you had to raise funding. I suppose there was a very, very intensive time because at that time, probably you were one of the first companies who asked the investors to fund a VR business. And at that time, it must have been even much harder than now with all these, all these headsets out in the wild. So... Could you tell us a bit more about how it was to raise the first funds for your company? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the the first time we raised we raised the Series A, A round of funding, um, we uh, went up. To, James and I lived in San Francisco for a few months, uh, demoing and pitching every single day and iterating on our pitch deck and company design and business plan and all of those things and. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a good time. It was actually, honestly, it was pretty, it was tough until I'll just, you know, uh, it was, it was tough until Oculus got acquired. Uh, once Oculus got acquired, that was basically blood in the water. Um, right. because there was a market for VR acquisition. So, uh, you know, there's some consolidation basically. Uh, so we had a good foothold. We were up there. We were talking to numerous investors, really working your way into the investor networks. It was the hardest thing, the ability to, we got a place in Noe Valley up in SF and the ability to get, you know, uh, was it like, uh, someone from Andreessen Horowitz or, you know, some of these big, you can't just call up, um, you know, the, the head of one of the big VC funds and say, Hey, come on over to, to Noe Valley and, and check out what we're doing. Um, it was just, it's very difficult to do that. So we had to work our way through many networks and work our way up to some of the best VCs in the Valley. But that took a long time. James and I were, you know, nobody's at that point, right? Um, we really didn't have, you know, uh, we were people working in a research lab. James had, you know, worked briefly at Insomniac and I had done some professional software engineering work uh, before going to USC. But, you know, really we hadn't, um, we weren't well known enough to really reach out to companies like that. So um, we uh, worked our way up through those networks and uh, we were talking to the right people at the right time when the Oculus um, acquisition occurred. And once that happened, basically, they, they, all of the, the VCs kind of looked up and looked around to see what, what was around them. And we were basically the highest quality, um, you know, most impressive virtual reality company um, that they could see at that time. And uh, or one of the one of the one of the ones I would say. And so once that happened, I'd say it was it was easier and we were able to secure funding and then secure some uh, some follow on investors. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, that's kind of the funding process uh, in a nutshell. And then and then we've raised subsequent rounds of funding after that. Great. Wow. Interesting. So um, what was your first round of funding? Did you get a, some angel investment first or how did you start the very beginning? So we actually, we had two angel investors for this from the start. We raised uh, $250,000 um, and it was, uh, or 275 to be exact, but the bulk was 250 and it was from two people um, who, uh, I can't get into too much detail, but they yeah. um, were family uh, friends of ours. They're actually our, um, through our composer who had worked with us on uh, Wild Skies, who was James' friend who we met at USC. Um, and basically they were, uh, you know, just, um, professional people in Los Angeles who like to make small investments. And, um, I remember this one meeting at a coffee shop. I, I came to meet with one of them and he, uh, I was, I brought a 100 page business plan. It's funny. It was probably the last business plan I ever wrote. Like, like <laughs> last business plan of that style yeah. of, kind of the old school style. You right. know, the, once you get to the Valley, people don't really want that. They, things kind of move faster than that, I would say. Um, but there, uh, you know, wrote out this this heavily researched business plan and kind of went through multiple meetings with these angel investors and, uh, you know, we're finally able to get them to agree to that round of funding, and that allowed us to to open up an office, a small one, 
hire a few people and basically get to work on building a smaller prototype and a new a new game prototype. And then once we had that wrapped up, it was James and I were it's like, okay, let's move up to Silicon Valley and set up shop and then just start working our way through these networks. It's kind of like um, you know, if you ever play StarCraft, it's like building a barracks halfway across the map so you can like it's like a forward outpost or something, you know. That's kind of uh, to start the invasion, you know. That that's kind of the way I was uh, I was thinking about it. Um, so it, I, I would say that's a, a good strategy to to really raise funding is you just you go all all out, you know. You uh, you you move you move there. You um, what is it? You land on the you land on the beach and then you burn the ships when you get there, right? It's like <laughs> nice. you know, that that sort of thing. That that really gives you um, uh, the fortitude to stick it out and actually be able to raise funding. Right. So you got this 275,000, um, you moved um, to the valley and mm -hmm. you just get into the networks, talk with everyone who would listen to you and told him about Servios. So at that moment in time, when you when you moved to Silicon Valley, which is expensive, of course, how long was your runaway? I, I mean, how long could you survive without getting any funds? And um, yeah, tell us a bit more about how long it took from setting up shop in the valley until you really got that Series A? Yeah, I mean, it took us, uh, I would say we had about maybe four or five or six months of runway, something like that. Um, and it took us about two to three months to secure funding. Um, so I think they usually say give yourself six months um, to do it. And uh, it didn't take us quite as much time. I think we went up there in like, it's like January or February. We actually bought, um, and we were doing it pretty quick too. We, we, we bought, this uh, like two bedroom place for like four thousand dollars a month, uh, and we got it sight unseen. You know, which means I didn't go up there to look at it. Right, I just looked at looked at pictures, and I was like, okay, this looks good, good right. enough. And we needed enough space to demo virtual reality. James and I both had to live there, so it was kind of uh, you know something that you have to take the take those risks basically. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it took us. Uh, you know, if you're if you're working on this every day, uh, it, it'll take you. Yeah, a few months to work through those those uh, networks, and you have to do it in the right time of year too. We started in I think, February, it was January or February, and so that's I would say ideally that's the best time uh, to really go after it. You know, if you have from January all the way until May or June before some of the summer things happen, that's a really solid chunk of time. You can do it in the fall too, but it just it, 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 you're you're working with less time there. Right. I suppose you could already use the connections that you made at USC with Paul Malucky, for example, that probably helped you, right, to get into those um, networks? Uh, it helped a little bit. Um, Palmer was, you know, an advisor for us, but to be honest, at that point, his hands were full with what was going on with Oculus, so he of was, of he course. didn't really have too much time for that. Right. We did, I mean, we went there a few times, met a few people, did a few demos, um, but it was, uh, it was a little, a little bit, uh, I think they were, keeping themselves pretty buttoned up for the acquisition that ultimately happened. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. So um, it was around the time that Oculus was bought by, by Facebook, when you were in, when you just set up shop there? Well, we, uh, we were there. Um, I actually remember vividly the uh, moment in time when Oculus was purchased. I was actually at Intel. We were demoing our stuff for the Intel... Um, I forget what the division it's the like human computing interaction division, uh, the one where they have the real sense cameras. I forget what it's called. Uh, yeah, we were demoing our work. Um, you know, we're demoing zombies in the holodeck um, and the hardware that we built for them. And I remember just looking on my phone or getting a call or getting a text or something that had occurred at that time. And so that was like halfway through what we were doing from a funding round perspective. Once again, working our way through networks. I had never known anyone at Intel or been to, you know, Intel before. And, you know, at that point I was talking to Intel Capital and, you know, in, in the building I was talking, they had, I think, I think, I think they flew some engineers down from like Oregon or something. I, I like, this was, you know, so like we, we were kind of like on our way working through networks at that point. But then once that occurred, I think everyone we were talking to kind of just like, they, they went like, oh shit, like we really got to, these guys are, are going to be hot, you know, so when, and that allowed us to really get a, a great lead investor, um, a very quality investor. That is amazing. So in that moment, when you when you looked on your phone and it said like, OK, Oculus got acquired, were you directly aware of the fact how good that is for your for your um, looking for funds? You know, I didn't. I, I think we were so deep in it at that point that, it, uh, you know, it didn't. Um, 
I don't think we really processed it. I honestly right. can't remember. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, I don't think I was experienced enough to really understand the, okay. the, the market dynamics that well at that point. Right, right. Um, at that moment in time, how old were you? Uh, 26, I want to okay. say. Okay, right. Wow, 26, that's, 27, yeah. that is incredible. So um, I'm also wondering, um, can you still remember what was your high concept pitch at that time that you were like telling people your one sentence, like, okay, we make the best VR games or what was it? Um, so we were building a VR hardware platform um, and it was more, it, you know, it had, see back then Oculus was just a head-mounted display. Right. So everything from motion controllers to, Uh, you know, even um, kind of uh, building out kind of more of a robust platform and everything. Um, really, none of that existed. Um, so our pitch was to basically, we wanted to be the Apple of VR. We wanted to build uh, like a full stack hardware and software platform for VR. Um, we ended up pivoting uh, at some point after that just because it turned out we needed a tremendous amount of money to be able to put something like that together. Not something that we knew at that time, um, but that was the, the original goal was to honestly do that and a lot of the other companies have filled in a lot of those gaps uh, up until this point. The way we saw it, you needed to really have one company own that process from start to finish to to make sure the experience was easy to use and easy to set up, that it wasn't um, this kind of like cobbled together thing like we have, we have today. Um, but what we didn't know is that uh, just the incredible complexity of the hardware and software that needed to be built. Um, even today, you know, the companies Valve and other companies, they, no company, no one company has the expertise to make the entire full stack platform right now and really do an incredible job with it. Oculus is close and Valve is close, a few other companies, but it's, it's very, very difficult. And essentially the companies have to work together. Um, you know, Nvidia has to work together with Valve, has to work together with Apple, whoever it is to make sure that their devices actually work and the, from end to end, it's a good experience. Right. So I'm wondering at what moment did you have the realization that you cannot become this full stack, this Apple of VR, and then, then you, you pivoted. So at what moment did you have this realization? Uh, I mean, I, to be honest, I can't talk in specifics about okay, that, sure. but it was sometime after we had, uh, um, after it was, it was either sometime in 2014, 2015. Um, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. And then, and then you said, okay, now we're, we're focusing on, on games. Was, was this the, the pivot point, like focusing on games or what was your goal then? Yeah. I mean, I think when we saw that, uh, we could have, um, you know, once some of the hardware platforms had been announced, we saw the potential to be essentially a launch product, uh, in particular with raw data and the HTC Vive. And so really that focus of, okay, here's a way where we can really you know, drive revenue and, and get ourselves into the, into the marketplace. Um, I think that was, uh, what really, uh, drove us toward focusing on, on that more so than, um, the hardware or the software platform. Okay. Got it. And, and to be honest, also just to, you know, to add a point to that is we've, it's games have always been in our DNA. So I think it's, uh, it, we, the hardware was a means to an end for us. Um, because it didn't exist, but really we've been wanting to create the the content, you know, from day one. Mm -hmm. Got it. So um, when when the Vive was out and the Oculus Rift, were you were you satisfied with these hardware platforms, and were you satisfied enough to think, okay, I can make games now that actually make you as a VR fan happy? Um, it's a good question. I would say that the platforms have various pros and cons. Um, it's, you know, I'm personally someone who's, you know, I doubt I'll, I personally will be fully satisfied with any of the devices for a long time okay. just because of the steps that we made early on to see what was possible. Um, you know, when you're uh, fully wireless and, you know, like where you have, like there's, you know, there's no joystick on the Vive. Um, you know, the setting up lighthouses is a pain in the butt. Um, setting up the rift is easier, but it's still by no means easy. Like until we have, you know, wireless, um, inside out tracked, but very powerful, uh, systems with very, um, functional controllers, like, like the rift controllers are much more functional and better designed, I would say than the Vive controllers, but 
for someone who's never played VR, the Vive controls are actually better because they're simpler. Like it's everything I think still needs to come a long way. And this is coming from someone, you know, we, we had developed our own head mounted display, motion tracking systems, controllers. Um, we have very specific uh, beliefs about how those things should be designed. And we're still kind of just like quietly rooting for some of the bigger companies. Like, come on, man, like, you know, get on with it. Make, make it like the Knuckles controllers, for example, are in their third generation and their, their valve is working on them. And I think the entire industry is kind of, everyone's taking a deep breath and realize that this thing is going to take a little while. And so none of the companies, there, there's not an arms race anymore or not an arms race is the wrong word. There's a bit of an arms race, but there's not a, um, it, it's not a hot war anymore. It's like V I would say VR is in a cold war right now. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting thought. Um, so the cold war, how can it be resolved <laughs> and why would you say it's a cold war? Uh, well, cold war in the sense that, um, I don't think anyone has a vested interest in racing to the finish line and crowning a champion right now because of, um, uh, technological limitations as they relate to the market. The amount of, um, of innovation uh, that is required and the amount of, um, like, okay, like give it your cell phone, right? Your cell phone has components from like, you know, like a hundred different countries in it or 50 different countries, something like that. Tons of, um, rare earth metals and, 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 you know, uh, glass that's made in upstate New York and all, all these different things. Right. And virtual reality is more complex than that, right? It requires more components from more different parts of the world that, um, you know, all have to come together. So there's a, there's a logistical nightmare to having to create proper virtual reality and then you have the um you have the actual technology that uh you know has to power it all of the uh software and hardware and sensors and, and kind of the innovation that has to go along along with those things a lot of those problems that have just not been figured out once again to really get it to a point where it's consumer grade uh and so you know i i think to understand where the market needs to go we have to kind of like take a bunch of steps back toward what a consumer product is and is supposed to be because I think we've kind of lost sight of that in the computer age. Uh, you know, consumer product is supposed to be um, easy and stupid. You know, it's supposed to be a thing that uh, never breaks. Basically, like it, it's functionality, it's fundamental functionality always works. You press a button and it turns on. I mean, a lot of the products we use today. They're not quite like this because they're so complicated. You know, our, our computers crash, our, our our phones have issues from time to time. We don't have dumb TVs anymore. We have smart TVs. Um, we even have, you know, all of our cars are computerized. And someone can hack into your car if they're really good, right? Like, like everything is much more complex today. And consumer expectation is an expectation of simplicity, you know, of, of something that can just be – be used like like a kind of standard commodity and so those two things are very much at odds and uh so to me we're just trying to boil the ocean with virtual reality it's going to take a very long time to iron those things out and then to to keep them all um i don't know the best way to describe this it's like you have to make like a thousand tiny decisions and they all have interdependencies right like when you're building a headband or display if you change the optics it might affect how the tracking works, and if you modify the tracking, it might actually have an impact on how the battery works. And if you modify the battery, it'll change the weight, which then means that it it it, it moves differently on your head, and it moves differently on your head. You got to change the optics again, right? Like it's kind of one of those problems. Um, so uh, I think it's just going to take a lot of diligent work, and some of these things are just problems that won't be solved until you give it a little bit of time and people understand through trial and error what works and what doesn't. Some things you, it's hard to solve scientifically. Sometimes the market has to solve them. So um, I think uh, basically that will have to work itself out over a certain period of time and then at a certain point uh, the potential market for VR will expand because um, simply put people will run run out of other things to do. Uh, you know, they'll get bored of watching Netflix and, and Hulu and they'll get bored of looking at, you know, Instagram models on their phone or whatever, whatever it is people do, right? Like eventually everyone will turn their attention toward virtual reality because they have nothing left. And then there will be um, the, the price of all the components and the complexity will be down enough and the software will be developed enough that uh, um, a large company will, get, will go, okay, this is the time. Press the button to spend $5 billion and, you know, let's make product X and, and ship it. Um, so I think that 
that time will come, but it's not a race anymore. You know, it's very much everyone. So it is the Cold War, right? Like every, like it is everyone stockpiling their missiles. They're waiting for the right time to strike. And at a certain point, you know, greed and capitalism will take over for somebody and there will be speculation and someone will uh, will step up and actually take a, a risk on something. Right. Got it. Um, so talking about consumer products having to be like dump, then probably the, the Oculus Quest is a great step in the right direction with that, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Oculus, I would say, is at the forefront of pushing toward this incredible dumb future um, where things just work. Uh, you know, you, you put something on, it works, and you kind of move forward. Um, it's still, you know, it, it's, it's difficult because it doesn't have a lot of horsepower at all. Um, so there's, there's certain constraints on, on the device. Um, but that being said, I think, uh, you know, in, it's inside out, it's wireless, uh, you know, it's self-contained. You can't see what someone's doing in it. That's kind of a downside. Um, so, you know, there, there's kind of pros and cons to, uh, uh, to that device. But, um, yeah, I think the Quest should be, uh, you know, if they make, once again, if they make all those decisions correctly, if they, they might, if they miss on two decisions, it, it could mean that the product, like, doesn't sell even close to as much as what it should. Because that's what I'm saying. There's so much interdependency. But theoretically, if they get all those decisions correct um, and they make a device that people can work into their daily lives, uh, then um, you know I, I think that has a lot of potential. That being said, I, w I will say this. Virtual reality – and Paul, Paul Merlucky has a good post on his blog about this, um, about how Quest will sell well, but it's, it's still not going to reach an expectation that, that we have. Um, I, I think our, our, our lifestyle, the way we've developed out how people live on a day-to-day -day basis in the 21st century is still not – quite that compatible with virtual reality um you know for example what, what you're isolated when you're in it right so uh right now just as we speak you know my, my dog is at my door to my office he wants to come in i'll let him in when, the, when we're done with the interview okay. um but you know i can't see him when i'm in virtual reality i might, might trip on him right um right. I, it's hard to be with other people people have responsibilities they have social networks that they're part of that they're connected to and other devices they use they, you know, you can just look over it and say hi to someone while you're using the device. In virtual reality, really, you can't really do that efficiently. So all those tiny little details have to be figured out, either in the device or our lifestyle has to change to get them to the point where they're as robust as the consumer devices that we use and take for granted on a daily basis. So I, I still think there's a lot of hurdles, even though the Quest is definitely a step in the right direction. There's just a lot of those little things um, that, uh, that that have, have to be worked out, even from the standpoint of what we think virtual reality is. Um, because I, I do think virtual reality is, you know, for someone who is married with a, with a you know, a dog and, and, you know, a big company and tons of, you know, people that they to interact with, it's hard to step into virtual reality, you know? It's hard to take that time out. That's actually why the arcades are so good. It's because they're designed for when you're out and you want something to do with friends and you're already in that mindset where you can take some time out of your life to do something right that makes sense so you just talked about like two decisions that oculus probably has to do right to make this a success could you probably um, talk a bit more about what kind of decisions this could be yeah it's a good good question um i'll give you an example uh the spring in the grab button on the oculus touch does not have enough tension Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not springy enough. And so most people, when they first use it, which we see a lot because we're constantly introducing people to virtual reality um, for the first time, uh, is that they don't know that button's there. Um, they have no expectation of that button being there and they're constantly holding it down all the time because they think they're just holding the controller. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of people don't even use game controllers, right? Like my, my wife has trouble with game, game controller buttons sometimes and it, she hasn't built up the muscle memory. Um, well, this is like an incredibly advanced game controller that uh, isn't designed with the, um, uh, the level of uh, um, experience that some of the other game controllers have because Sony's been making these things for like 25 years. Um, and Nintendo, that sort of thing. So right there, that one decision about that spring probably um, has a negative impact on half of all people who try the device, um, leading to design changes where people, you know, we, we made design changes where we don't even use the grab button a lot of the time because of that. Uh, and so you're minimizing what the controller can do and all that built-in Oculus functionality that they want to have. Um, so hopefully they get that right, you know, with the, uh, with the Oculus Quest. Um, you know, if it doesn't have enough battery life, you only play for 30 minutes, 
um, then uh, you know you're drastically limiting what is possible with it. Or if you're maybe you can play it longer, but they have overheating issues on. It. I'm not saying they will, but I'm saying like they have to check all of these boxes. And there's there's a tons of boxes. Does it does it work on everyone? Does it make does it hurt anyone's nose? You know how, how many noses have they tested it on? What do the optics get smudged? easily what is the the typical process for cleaning the optics like um all of these little details uh and some of their interdependencies they have to like like another example is um you know if you have you don't want too much light leaking into the head mount display but you also want it to you don't want moisture to build up inside of it right so it's like but if you let moisture come out that hole might add let light in so you have these competing things that you're trying to do in one device and the solution for that is typically to install a very small fan in it right but like they have to solve all these problems um and these problems are not solved overnight uh so you know there's a a myriad of other problems like that um that uh they're gonna have to have to solve um and, and get to all kind of coexist uh to be able to make a device that can be used on a consistent basis that's a robust device Right. So lots of things to consider. So I'm wondering, um, you said that for the Oculus Quest, of course, the games that have to be ported, they will have to go down in poly count a lot, right? There's like no way you can you can like uh, play the Rift games as they are as they are right now. So I'm wondering for your games, for the Servios games, would they be able to run as you intend them to run on the Quest? Uh, well, no. I mean, everything has to be ported to the Quest. You're talking about, um, you know, a uh, multitude of 10 uh, kind of horsepower level. Um, I would say from the graphics side, it's multitude of 10. From the CPU side, it might be like multitude of like three, like like a third of the power, something like that. Um, I'd have to look at, so normally we look at these things in uh, teraflops and gigaflops uh, of, of power is, is the best like rule of thumb, high level way to look at everything. Um, teraflops usually on the CPU side, gigaflops because it's um, it's running everything in parallel on the GP, on the GPU side, uh, and uh, I don't remember what the numbers are. I think they've said it's like an Xbox 360 or an Xbox or something, but those systems are also um, engineered in in different ways. When you come from a PC space, you're kind of just used to having a lot of power, and the power is very general. It's not very specific. Um, there's not a lot of chipset specific things you're doing because you want to support a wide number of systems. Well, with this, um, with it, sorry, with the console, it's the opposite. Usually you're, you're tailoring something specifically to that platform. And so the best hardware uh, or, or console developers make something for one console and they really have some crazy low-level engineering um, to make sure they're utilizing the low-level APIs. With Oculus Quest, um, Probably the best way to do it is to start a project from scratch on the Quest. What we found is, you know, a game developer just making a game and testing it, making a game, and testing it. They're iterating all, all day long, and you're testing it to the hardware that you have to benchmark it with. So porting something to the Quest is very difficult. That being said, it's easier for some games, harder for others. For us, raw data and sprint vector fairly difficult. They have large levels, multiple players, multiple skeletal meshes, um, very complex games. Uh, Creed and Electronauts, much easier actually, um, because they're simpler games. Uh, they're much more games about a, a, a very tight interaction system that's very close to you. Um, you know, Creed is you and one other person, right? I mean, you have a crowd, but the fundamental gameplay is, mu- is much more narrow. And same thing with Electronauts, just one skeletal mesh. And uh, really the graphics are not as important as the music there. Electronauts has CPU complexity, um, which has to be reduced um, to be able to to get on uh, something like that. So uh, I think you know for us we're going to look at the possibility of porting titles, um, but usually I think with in the case with uh, a lot of other people it's easier to develop something uh, from scratch for the quest. Okay, so perhaps we, we we might see Creed and Electronauts on on the quest. We don't know. I w- I would love to do that. I think Creed I people would love. <laughs> anything definitive right now i would love yeah. to see all of our games in the quest um but of from course. a technical standpoint yes. uh, I'll, I'll just say just to, you know not, not to uh, uh say anything in particular but from a technical standpoint Creed and electronauts are just a little fundamentally more easy okay that makes lots of sense um and uh, well now i would like to speak a bit more about your games we talked about a lot about now how you got to where you are right now and we talked about raw data and i would like to know 
after you have finished Raw Data, which is an amazing game. Uh, it's it's like a first person shooter, and uh, yeah, it's it's very cool. Um, what what was your thought process of coming up with with Sprint Vector? I believe Sprint Vector was your second game, right? And um, why did you decide to do this kind of sports game next? So Sprint Vector has uh, two conceptual starting points. Um, well, I, I would say they're yeah, I guess two conceptual starting points. The first one is something that we were working on called Obstacle Course, which was basically you know, we wanted to um, move around the virtual world uh, by climbing um, different uh, climbing different things, and really wanted to make like a virtual reality platformer. We wanted that that thrill of movement, um, kind of like a Super Mario or Super Monkey Ball, um, or kind of like American Ninja Warrior. A lot of climbing puzzles and uh, you know, like um, zip lines and ladders and um, uh, climbing walls and uh, what is it? The, um, like fireman's poles and all those kinds of things. Uh, we were building something like that, and that that was really you know going progressing in the right direction. It was a very interesting kind of research project. Um, and then the other side of it. Uh, so actually, well, I'll say it's a little more simple to say it this way. As we were developing that out, um, you know, and, and simultaneously with raw raw data, we realized that you know in raw data we shifted over from using joystick movement in bull time apex because bull time apex was actually using some proprietary hardware we had built where we could move around with a joystick well the vibe was coming out didn't have a joystick and people were getting nauseous this is in the big early you know i would say like I, people were afraid of nausea like they were afraid of marijuana in like the 40s or something um you know unjustly so in, in my opinion um i, I think it's made too much of a big Big, big deal of it. Uh, but back then it was like this terrifying thing. I mean, yeah. people at different companies, Oculus and Valve, a number of others were all very terrified of it. So we had to build our, our teleporting system in raw data. And we we're always annoyed that we couldn't move around. We couldn't run around, you know, like the fundamental thing that you do in a game is go move through space. And we weren't really doing it like the way you, you know, you'd expect. So we wanted to, um, solve that issue. We had done it with uh, grabbing objects and pushing yourself through the world and climbing and doing all those things, but we couldn't. The one thing we couldn't figure out how to do with this obstacle course demo is just walk forward. Like that was the one thing that, like, the one missing piece. And so um, we started experimenting with how could we make a system where you run by moving your arms um, and, and kind of uh, like 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 free running, and that that turned into what fluid locomotion is. And what we found is a bunch of tricks that make nausea easier to solve. Um, you know, vignetting and uh, even, uh, you know, to the point of like, okay, if we really want to solve nausea, if we want to make a game, like we basically wanted to, wanted to say, okay, nobody wants you to move around in virtual reality. Fuck that. We're going to make you run at 40 miles an hour. Like we wanted to kind of, you know, like really kind of we feel like we're kind of badasses in that way. We try to break rules, right? So basically we said, okay, if we make the user look forward most of the time, it's a, it's a racing game, then, um, you know, that is another way to reduce nausea. If they ever in the car and you get nauseous, they tell you to look at the horizon, right? Um, so it, it's a similar thing. You, you look at the horizon most of the time in Sprint Vector, that plus the vignetting plus the, uh, the actual motion that you're doing being similar to running with the expect, you know, it, it's based on your own brain's expectation of how running works. Um, all of those things put together allowed us to have, a, a racing game that where you didn't get nauseous and at that point you know any ra type of racing thing would get you nauseous so we were we were trying to be innovative right and that uh need to innovate is what led to sprint vector and as we, we were looking at it we're like okay mario kart right like we fucking love mario kart it's one of the greatest games of all time Same if here. we yeah yeah if we, we we take the basic you know some of the basic design principles of mario kart and apply them to both the fluid locomotion running aspect and then the obstacle course aspect um, and build in other systems like that. That's really how we build out that game. So it's like Mario Kart meets like Tony Hawk. Like we, you know, it really is kind of um, that style of game. And then you know, then we as we started building that out, we got inspired by you know Japanese game shows like MXC, and um, you know, basically started building creative around that. And James and his team, uh, Bennett and Hunter, and a number of other people, they they um, you know really ran with the the creative aspect of it and turned the creative into something very very special. And uh, yeah, it just it just came together. It's amazing. I love the game. I think it's a masterpiece. Thank you so much for bringing this game to the world. However, oh. I must 
also say I have destroyed two headsets playing Sprint Vector because <laughs> I, yeah, really, I destroyed my right. HTC Vive and I just I re just recently destroyed my new Samsung Odyssey Plus <laughs> because I was I was like sweating so much, right? So so what is your estimate? Like how many how many headsets were destroyed by people playing Sprint Vector? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, Probably somewhere in the in the thousands if you include all the arcades too. I mean, um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, it's, that's I mean that's something I could talk about is the active VR side. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, we uh, have this belief that you know there's there's we're trying to increase immersion, right? Trying to make you feel feel something, right? And part of being immersed is um, being active. The more you're moving around, like I, I like virtual reality is basically an illusion, right? So right. the more you're moving, the less you're able to take a hard look at the uh, uh, at the um, at what might be kind of weird right so it's it's basically active VR is a form of, of magician's sleight of hand it, it's the same basic concept um, or or when when the ca how the camera moves in a George Lucas movie to kind of cover up the fact that these are shots pasted together um, it's basically our trick to make you feel more immersed and so we really like to push that to the max um, all do. of our games are they're about movement even electronauts is the light you know, kind of relaxed movement, still movement, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a, they're about getting into a rhythm and, and and feeling very physical. And so the downside of that is, uh, you know, the the fact that you're going to be sweating. And I think that's uh, you know one of those things that won't be solved for a little while until head mounted displays. Like at some point, head mounted head mounted display will just be like a pair of glasses, and you'll be sweating all over the place and you won't really care too much wipe your glasses off every now and then but it'll just be like going to the gym wearing a pair of glasses so i think you know we, we are going to get there and that's going to really be a, a boon to the, the kinds of products that we make right right but i'm wondering did you get some kind of backlash of people who actually did destroy the headsets and then told you guys hey you you guys made me sweat and now i have to buy another headset why didn't you include some kind of warning message or what I mean, I don't think it's that bad. Um, I don't know. You, you've had some bad luck, it sounds like. I haven't had, honestly, heard of too many destroyed headsets. All right. We've had more destroyed objects in people's <laughs> right, living exactly. rooms. From, from <laughs> okay, good data, point, too. To be honest. Good yeah, point I mean, too. It, destroying hardware, you know, yeah. has always been a part of the, it's a part of the fun, you know. Yeah, it, well, it was kind of fun. It was not so fun to deal with HTC for the customer service, but um, yeah, yeah <laughs> well, well, anyways. That, yeah, I think... Pro it it really comes with the fact that you are moving around, right? You will sweat. So hopefully, I really hope that in the in the in the near future, the H and Bs will be more waterproof, right? Because yeah, you will sweat. I I love to play these games, right? I love Creed, and I love to get physical, and that's actually part of the fun. So I totally don't blame it on you. Hey, why do you make me sweat? I more blame it on the hardware. Why is it still so easy to break when you're actually wearing it on your head, right? Well, I mean, so once again, uh, you know, think of that as one extra variable yeah. that has to be balanced with all, all of right. the other variables. If you want to make something right. more durable, you have to make it more structurally sound. And to do that, you have to add plastic or you have to move components around that will cause other variables to shift as well. So it's, um, you know, uh, like I said, coming from experience of developing head mounted displays, it's not uh, – it's not fun to do that and you're going to end up with uh you know you you have to something has to give right you can't get you can't get everything right so now that i have somebody who is experienced in making headsets would it be really so hard to make a headset waterproof what would it take could there be some some kind of layer on the pcb that would like secure it from sweat uh i mean no anything with power running through it is fundamentally not waterproof Okay, so yeah, you sense, have to yeah. seal out any of the components and you're ventilating those components, right? right they, right. if they're entirely sealed, they'll get hot, right? you have to have air flowing and then air is going to carry the water that, you know, so the water, like, so the air has to come from the outside, not from the inside. Um, so, you know, waterproof head mounted display, um, like it's also without ventilation, you're going to, that sweat is uh, just going to stick in there more. It's going to fog up the lenses much more easily. So really, right, airflow right. is your friend. And I honestly, I, I'll be honest, I haven't heard of many of of, of sweat related okay, defect issues. Then it's me. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess so. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a hard sweater. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think um, so. I, well, based on things that I've read, I mean, obviously there's sweating because you're active, right? So yeah. you want to be in a cool environment. But there's also um, a certain kind of sweat that is like a nervous sweat, and not okay. nervous like like psychological nervous, but nervous like um, like 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 you're. How can I put it? People who get nauseous will sweat more too. Right. Um, yeah. Like something like the 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 body is rejecting a little bit of the simulation or or right. or something think, like that. I think um, I'm, and, you know what I think I'm just like a heavy sweater when I get like active. I, I was like really trying to 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 win some to get like the high score or the fastest lap in <laughs> in in sprint vector. So I was like playing it for for long times without taking the thing off because I was so immersed. Like you know like okay one more round one more round and I believe if I just made like breaks after 20 minutes and wiped myself then it would be a fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, it's tough in your arms, too, in Sprint Vector. I mean, I think the really active games that we have, uh, you know, I mean, like Sprint Vector and Creed, you, uh, to me, you play them every day for 30 minutes, right? You get your workout in, yeah. um, you know, and, and you're, you're just, like, floored, and then you go on and do something else. Raw right. data, you probably maybe play two missions, right? Yeah. Maybe play for an hour. Um, Electronauts is kind of like, you know, you play it maybe once a week, but you play it for, like, two or three hours, on a Saturday night, you know, because it's not quite as intensive. So it's, they're just different play styles and kind of how they would, Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you interview them with your life. Exactly. Cool. So then you made, yeah, you made um, Sprint Vector, incredible. Then your next game, um, Electronauts, right? That's right. Electronauts came next. So and, um, how was the thought process? Yeah. Why, why did you want to make this kind of music game? Yeah, so Electronauts is um, an interesting project. It uh, started basically uh, in really in 2016, where um, we had uh, two people left over from um, people who we were working with on the hardware side before, and uh, they um, really had a good knowledge of uh, music and how to develop music technology. And so we developed a prototype that was based on a game called Plink. Um, which is like a tiny little um, kind of uh, music toy. And uh, this is the idea of kind of making something that um, allows you to do something in virtual reality that you couldn't normally do before. So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I fundamentally believe that virtual reality is a technology that is empowering. Uh, normally you go into a virtual world and inside that world you can do things you, you never would be able to do. Um, you know, whether it's be in the future and fight uh, you know, uh, robots is like a badass action hero in raw data or run at 40 miles an hour and uh, jump and fly and do all the things you do in Sprint Vector, kind of feel like a superhero basically. Um, you know, you can't normally do those things. So it gives you the experience of doing those. Well, with Electronauts, uh, the idea was to give you the experience of being a musician, of actually being able to, to play music and not just play music at, uh, in like a rhythm game, but improvise and actually create music. Um, so it's kind of... Uh, makes you feel like, uh, you know, like a badass, um, like a guitar soloist or, or musician. And uh, this is, like I said, based on a prototype that we had developed um, uh, fairly early on. And uh, that prototype really gave you this incredible feeling, very unique feeling of being able to play music. But also what it, what it doubled as is a way to DJ and bring that music out into the real world and you can actually use it to to DJ parties or have little parties with your friends and, and kind of get an ex experience of what it's like to be a musician. So I have always been a big fan of um, taking technology and using it to to really augment you and give you superpowers. Like I am not a musician, but put me in Electronauts and I am a musician and I'm a musician for people in the real world. I can play them a song, right? Like that's a very, um, very unique thing that you can give to someone. Um, and so it started as a prototype and we started, uh, experimenting, trying to, um, you know, uh, build something that, uh, really was just fundamentally fun, um, that you could go into and in, in, in 10 seconds, you're already, uh, you know, having an experience that you've never had before. And, uh, really Electronauts is, um, something to be played when you're, when you're inebriated to, to be honest is when you, it's to be played when you're kind of partying. Um, it, we kind of wanted to make the ultimate party game something that we could uh, not just have fun playing virtual reality when we were partying at the office or hanging out with friends, but something that actually could be the uh, focal point of a party that you could actually get together with people because you wanted to do that thing specifically. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of a general overview. Um, but it's like I said, it started as a small research project and um, we ended up um, – 
using it as a vehicle to get involved with a lot of musicians, a lot of the people that we've signed uh, in the game. And uh, we ended up building this small team to work on it that all, everyone was very much uh, invested in the music industry or had, were really big fans of music, um, music toys and music production. Um, and uh, it, it's just one, once again another project that came together and ended up being very special. It is incredible. And you so succeed at making me feel like a super mu musician. I think that's really the fantastic thing. I'm really not like very talented in making music, but when I'm in Electronauts, I really do feel like a badass. And yeah, thank you for thank you so much for this. And I'm wondering, like it, it feels like magic because it feels like you cannot even make it sound bad. Right, you're using some kind of music scale that it just it fits every time, right? Exactly. Yeah, you're um, so you're always in time, and yes, yeah, so you're always at the right tempo, and then you're also always in key. Right. So there's nothing right. you can really do that will cause the sound song to sound bad. And then if you're really good, the song will sound really, really good. Exactly. So the typical reaction for people when they first get in there is, "Oh my god!" Like. I'm, How can I do that? I didn't know I was so good at being a musician, and then exactly. they, they take off the heads of three hours later, and they're just like, "Where am I? Like, what you know, what what, what just happened?" Um, and and playing it for someone else too. They're they're you know, it's it's a great way. Like, if you want to impress a date, right? Get electronauts <laughs> and just you know tell them that you've been like practicing this for a while, and you wanted to play them a song you wrote or something, and get in there and just play a little bit, and they'll be floored, right? Um, True. So it's. it's Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just want to say, yeah, it's really amazing. Like I was streaming it on Twitch and then my followers were thinking like, what? The Sebastian guy, he can even do music. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really amazing. You really, really succeeded at that. Amazing. Well, thank you. I, yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting idea. Uh, so the way Electronauts works is it, it works uh, similarly to how a head mounted display works in terms of, um, It uses a small gap in latency, basically like 30 milliseconds, uh, where you your brain will, will will just assume something happened in real time because it's a small enough window. Inside of that window is is how long it takes for the simulation to run. Simulation runs in, you know, it's 11, 11 milliseconds um, per uh, frame, so you can get squeeze like three frames in there. Um, and then for a lot of the songs that we're doing, the gap between when you hit something. And when a note needs to be quantized is within that 30 millisecond window as well for various BPMs of different songs and also for specific instruments and particular instruments that have what's called a quick attack. If you know what attack, decay, sustain, release is in, in music terminology. And basically um, that allows us to fool the user into thinking that their input is in effect playing that music even though it has a slight delay. And so that is really the magic that allows you to – Uh, feel like you're, uh, you know, a, a real musician, and um, it, it's an idea that, I, like I said, I got from this really small game, and I've been tinkering with the idea for a long time. Like, how do I get this new game? What can I make with this concept? Because this little uh, game that I would give to people, they would just on my phone tap a few buttons, and immediately their face would light up. Right? And anyone you handed it to, they would ha they would be delighted when they saw it without having any knowledge of anything or any formal kind of learning or what have you. Um, and so I've always aspired to make universal applications that just feel good fundamentally almost like a nintendo nintendo style of design mm -hmm. um and uh electronauts was really um you know an attempt to do that kind of in the, the musical space and without a doubt you've completely succeeded with this nathan thank you so much for telling us about your games and for telling us more about the servio's background story without a doubt we could keep on talking here for hours but this episode is coming to an end now we have already talked for more than an hour so thank you so much nathan for joining this podcast thanks for having me and that's it for this episode of people in xr if you made it this far then probably you like the show so why don't you leave a review at your favorite podcast provider so more people can find the show or directly share it with your fellow vr enthusiasts my name is sebastian Ang, and i'm looking forward to meet you in the next episode 